Are we headed for a Great Depression 2.0? The short answer, no, we aren't. Why do I say that? Because I think we have been in a Great Depression 2.0 since 2008. And I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over GDP growth. But before we even get there, let's actually define what an economic depression is. For that, let's go straight to the internet. An economic depression is a deep and long-lasting period of negative economic growth with output falling for at least 12 months and GDP falling by over 10%. A depression means the economy experiences a significant fall in output, higher unemployment, and a disruption to normal economic activity. It is a deep and prolonged form of a recession, which is negative economic growth. So the takeaway is negative real GDP growth when you adjust for inflation and high unemployment. But we start with GDP. So to understand that really, really well, let's go right back to the internet and Investopedia. The letters GDP are flung around often by the President, the Federal Reserve Board, journalists, and many others. They stand for Gross Domestic Product, which represents the overall market value of all the goods and services a country produces. In a way, it's like a price tag on a country's output, and it measures the size of the economy. The price is determined with the following formula. C plus G plus I plus NX equals GDP, where C is the nation's private consumption or consumer spending, G is the sum of government spending, I is the sum of businesses' capital spending, Spending, and NX is the nation's total net exports, exports minus imports. GDP is an important number because it indicates whether a country's economy is growing and expanding or shrinking and contracting. So the bulk of GDP is spending, consumer spending, government spending, and spending on investment. So obviously prices are a very big deal. This tells us the overall economic output of the economy, how healthy or how weak it actually is. So let's look at a chart of GDP adjusted for inflation. So this would be real GDP going back to 1996 all the way to 2020. Goes from 10 trillion up to 20 trillion. 96, we're right around the 10 trillion mark. We go up at flat lines in the recession after the dot-com bust. It goes down slightly in the GFC, and since then, it's gone straight up until we get to the Cervasa sickness. Of course, now it's come down. But keep in mind, this is using about a 2% rate of inflation as a deflator. So they'll take nominal GDP and they'll bring it down by the rate of inflation. That's why prices are so important for GDP. Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart of CPI. And keep in mind, this is what the government is willing to admit to, right around 2%. I think it's extremely important we understand how CPI is actually calculated. What are they using for this basket of goods? They've got food and beverage, housing, apparel, transport, medical, recreation, education, and other but it's actually a weighted average. So food and beverage is 15% of the overall, housing 42%, and transportation is 15%. Editor, go ahead and throw up a pie chart of exactly how this is broken down. But the main thing I want you to notice is just between food and beverage, housing, and transport, that makes up 72% of the CPI. But I want you to ask yourself a question. Are the prices you've been paying for the last 20 years for food, housing, and transport, have they been going up more than 2% per year? 
I think the obvious answer is yes, they've been going up a lot more than that. Let's go a little further down the rabbit hole. We've got an awesome looking Prius right here. This year's model is $20,000. Next year's model, let's say is $22,000. So a price increase of 10%. Most people would say, well, that's a 10% rate of inflation. Therefore, it really doesn't add to GDP because no more goods or services were sold. It's just prices went up. But the government would come in and say, well, wait a minute. What if this year's Prius is 5% better? You're getting kind of more of a car, right? What they do is they reduce the rate of inflation from 10% down to 5%. So if prices went up by 10%, and they only deflate them by 5%, all of a sudden, you've got 5% GDP growth. But you haven't sold any more cars. It's still the exact same, but the government would claim that the economic output has increased by 5%. But let's take it a step further. We've got steak and we've got hamburger, obviously. <laughs> you can tell that's a juicy looking steak, isn't it? Well, the prices of steak go from $10 up to $11 the next year. The government would come in and say, okay, well, what's the price of hamburger? And they'd look at this and say, well, okay, well, the price of hamburger went from $9 to $10, but hamburger, it's still beef. It might not be steak, but it's still from the same animal, right? And they look at that and say, well, if you can still buy the same type of meat from the same animal for $10, we're going to say that prices or inflation hasn't gone up at all. But keep in mind, the price of the steak actually did go from $10 to $11. So GDP would show a 10% increase, nominal GDP, but the deflator would be zero. So you'd see a 10% increase in real GDP. In other words, the government would say that economic output has increased by 10%. The United States is 10% richer as a result of someone going from eating steak to hamburger. What they've done in economic terms is they've changed the CPI from a cost of goods index to a cost of living index. But any third grader could tell you the best way to measure if prices are going up is just to take a basket of stuff and measure if the prices are going up. <laughs> it's not rocket science, right? And the real problem is GDP is a measurement of spending. In other words, it's a measurement also of prices, nominal GDP. But what they're using to deflate nominal GDP to get to real inflation-adjusted GDP doesn't have anything to do with prices like it used to. It only has to do with a standard of living. So how do you deduct a measurement of prices by a standard of living? And again, going back to the third grader, shouldn't you deduct a measurement of prices by actual prices? Yeah, it would make sense. But let's go back to our chart momentarily. Most of us would agree that 2% inflation over the last, call it 10, 20 years, has been extremely low when you look at what you personally spend on food, housing, and transportation. So you're probably saying to yourself right now, okay, George, I get it, I get it, I get it. I understand how CPI understates inflation. Therefore, if they use that to bring down nominal GDP, that will overstate real GDP. It'll make the economy look a lot healthier than it really is. Oh, but wait, <laughs> there is more. The real number the government uses to get real GDP, in other words, economic output, the health of the economy, your standard of living isn't the CPI. 
It's something called the GDP deflator. And if you had to guess if the deflator understates inflation, in other words, overstates GDP growth, more or less than the CPI, what would you say? Of course, it understates inflation. It overstates real GDP even more. And if we look at a chart of shadow stats that's actually adjusted for the rate of inflation, the way the government used to measure it, and the government, that's the word I want to emphasize, not some tinfoil hat guy in a garage, the way the government themselves measured inflation back in the 1980s, we'd see that real GDP since 2006 has flatlined, if not gone down. In other words, since 2006, if we really adjust for the real rate of inflation, we would have been in an economic depression. Step number two, GDP confusion. And most of us, the average Joe and Jane, think of GDP growth as though the private sector, the real economy, is expanding. If we see GDP go up, we think that businesses, small businesses on the corner, mid-sized business and publicly traded companies, well, they've got to be doing a lot better, right? Not so fast. Let's dive into this a little deeper. First of all, going over debt to GDP. We have a chart going back to 1970 all the way to 2020. On the left, we go from 30% up to 110%. Notice in the 70s, it goes down. 80s, it's up. We hit the recession, it goes way up. But during most of the 90s, the debt to GDP ratio goes down. And a lot of you may be saying, yeah, George, that's because Clinton had a budget surplus at the end of his term. And you would be right, but debt to GDP was going down even before Clinton had the surplus. Then 2000, it starts to go back up. We have another recession. In the GFC, it goes parabolic all the way up to where it is today, over 100%. Now, keep in mind, this chart just goes to 2020. It doesn't include the Cerveza sickness. So right now, as governments are running three, four trillion dollar deficits, which will probably be increasing over the next year or two, the debt to GDP ratio is gonna go buzz light year to infinity and beyond, that's for sure. But most of us see the debt to GDP ratio is government spending versus government tax receipts. So how much is the government spending? How much is it collecting in taxes? But we need to take the next step. It's much more complex than that. It's also a measurement of the government percentage of the economy. Check this out. If we have government deficit of $2 trillion, we know they're spending in excess of their budget or what they're collecting in taxes of $2 trillion. Let's say the same year, GDP goes up by $1 trillion. And I'm just talking about in nominal terms. But let's say during the same year, GDP goes up by $1 trillion. So most people would say, okay, our economy grew but it only grew as a result of the government's deficit spending, putting it on the credit card. So during this year, debt to GDP would actually increase. Just to reiterate, because the government was spending $2 trillion and GDP only went up by $1 trillion. Therefore, again, debt to GDP ratio goes up. But let's think this through. If the government is spending $2 trillion, meaning creating $2 trillion in additional GDP, because remember, it's a measurement of prices and spending in the economy, that means that if GDP only went up by $1 trillion, the private sector would have shrunk by $1 trillion. If the private sector would have stayed the same, then GDP 
would have been $2 trillion. If the private sector would have grown, then GDP would have been over $2 trillion and debt to GDP would have gone down, not up. In other words, whenever you see debt to GDP going up, that means the government is expanding and the private sector is shrinking. And check out this chart. It's government spending as a percentage of GDP. And it goes way back. You'll see editor throw up the chart to like the 1700s. And boy, it'd be nice to go back to those times, that's for sure. But I start the chart 1913. Why? Because we had the gift that keeps on giving. The Federal Reserve came into existence. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as we got the Federal Reserve, the percentage of government spending of the economy continues to grow. World War I, it spikes up, comes back down. World War II spikes up. And at the end of World War II, it keeps going up and up and up. And of course, when we have a recession, it tends to spike up. So now with the government deficit spending during the Cervasa sickness, we know the percentage of government involvement in GDP is going to go parabolic and that means the private sector is going to continue to shrink and shrink. So you'd have to ask yourself, is the economy more dynamic? Is it more robust when the government is 8%, therefore the private sector is 92% of the economy? Or is the economy more efficient when the government is 40% of the economy. In other words, the private sector is only 60% of the economy. And it's only going to get worse, meaning the government is going to become a bigger and bigger portion of GDP, and the private sector is going to continue to shrink and shrink and shrink. The bottom line is whatever economic environment we've been in since 2008, it's going to continue to get worse if you believe the government is less efficient than the private sector. Step number three, unemployment. This is always the rebuttal I hear. Whenever I bring up the GDP adjusted for proper inflation that shows it's flat or even going down since 2008, they say, yeah, but George, that's impossible. We can't be in a depression. Look at the unemployment rate. It's at all time lows. Right. Okay. Well, fair enough. Let's dive into that. We've got a chart of unemployment going back to 1996, or actually kind of 1994. That's when the government really changed the methodology for unemployment. Shocker. Right about the time they did the same thing for the CPI as well. But this chart, 1994 to 2020. On the left-hand side, we go from 0% unemployment up to 35%. The red line indicates U3. This is the headline number you always hear in the news. When they talk about the unemployment rate, they're specifically referring to the U3 number. Black line indicates U6. We'll get into that in just a moment, the differences. The blue line is all of the unemployed people. And you would think that the unemployment rate would include all of the unemployed people, but you would be wrong. <laughs> so let's go through this chart. The unemployment rate goes down to 2000. We had that big boom, then the crash, a recession goes back up and it goes way up during the GFC to 10%. But since then, according to the government, it's gone down to we get to a low point just before the Cerveza sickness. Now it's spiked up to 15%. U6 followed the same trajectory, although we did have a lot more slack in the labor market. That's a completely separate video. But it goes back down as well to 2000, Cerveza sickness. Now it's up to 22%. And the all-inclusive unemployment number is currently at 35% according to shadow stats. Now let me explain the differences between these three. The red U3 number, 
headline unemployment. This is what you hear all over the media. This is probably what you assume is all the people who are actually unemployed looking for a job. But it only includes people who are unemployed that have actually looked for work over the last four weeks. If you're unemployed and you have not looked for work in the last four weeks, then technically, according to the government, you're not unemployed. It's crazy how that works, isn't it? The U6 number would, of course, include those in the U3. They'd also include people who are unemployed that have looked for work within the last five weeks to a year. This includes all the people that are working two, three part-time jobs. Maybe they're in the gig economy. They wish they had full employment, but they just can't find a good job. Of course, it also includes the people that just flat out haven't found work. If you're unemployed and you haven't looked for a job within the last year, the government doesn't even count you as unemployed. You literally don't even exist. That's why Shadow Stats picks these people up as well with this chart of the blue line because they, like everyone else on the planet Earth, would assume if you're unemployed, you're unemployed, regardless of when the last time you looked for a job was. I also want to point out the average length of unemployment is 40 weeks. So how many of these people didn't start looking for a job till after 10 weeks or maybe 20 weeks? Those people that didn't start looking for a job right away wouldn't even have been included in the unemployment numbers. Although obviously by anyone's definition, they're unemployed. Also, I've read in several states, unemployment benefits can last as long as 99 weeks. And I'm sure that'll be extended because of the Cervasis sickness. Also, a lot of people are being paid more on unemployment now than they were working their full-time job, not to mention their part-time jobs and their side hustles in the gig economy. So let's think about this. If someone knew they could get unemployment for 99 weeks, why on earth would they start looking for a job within the first year? Of course, now some people would, of course, but a lot of people are just gonna kick back, relax, go on vacation, not do anything till well after a year, and then they're gonna start looking for a job. So all the people that would fall into that category aren't even included in U6. The black number, let alone U3, which is the unemployment number you always hear about in the media. Oh, but wait, there's more. You may be asking yourself, George, what was the unemployment rate during the Great Depression 1.0? Well, it got up to about 25%, I believe, in 1933. But you've got to remember the way they measured the statistics back then way different than we do now, even different than we did prior to 1994. In fact, back in the 30s, when they measured the unemployment rate, they included government workers in the unemployment rate. That's how inefficient they knew government was back then. And it wasn't all of them, but it was a good percentage of government workers they felt detracted from productivity. They detracted from GDP growth. They didn't add to GDP growth. So these government workers were included in the unemployment rate. If you take out the government workers, then unemployment would have been a lot lower. When I mean a lot, probably 17, 18% instead of 25%. Compare that to the last 10 years since the GFC. And if we look at our unemployment rate, when you include everybody that's actually unemployed, we're at 25% over the entire last decade. And now we're up to 35%. Anyone who is intellectually honest would have to admit that the real rate of unemployment is much higher than the number the government wants us 
to believe. And finally, people always say, yeah, but I don't see any bread lines. There's no soup kitchens. There's none of this anymore, George. And just look at those black and white pictures of the Great Depression. People were lined up around the corner. That's right, but remember what Henry Hazlitt has taught us. It's not just about the seen, but the unseen. Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart of recent statistics for welfare. 2% of Americans are on unemployment. And of course, the number is way higher now with the Cervasa sickness. 4% housing assistance, so Section 8. 15% of American households receive food stamps. The bottom line is 49%, almost half of every American household receives some form of government benefit. And keep in mind, this was before the Cerveza sickness. So now it's obviously much, much higher. So GDP, when you're honest about inflation, has gone down since 2008. Unemployment has been sky high since 2008, very consistent with what we saw in the Great Depression. And we definitely have bread lines and soup kitchens. It's just now they're not seen out in the open, they're unseen. So again, to answer the question, are we headed for a Great Depression 2.0? No, we're not, because we have been in a Great Depression 2.0 since 2008. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.